Good morning, and welcome to worship at the First Presbyterian Church in Goshen, New York. This is the seventh Sunday of Easter, Ascension Sunday, as it is celebrated in the greater church. We welcome you and let us open with prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, in the risen Christ, you have called us into a new life, transformed us to receive your Holy Spirit afresh, that in our love for you, we may be made ready to serve the world in his name. Amen. We come now to the prayers of the church, the pastoral prayer first, and I will lead you at the end of it into our Lord's Prayer. Within the Presbyterian Church, we use debt and debtors rather than trespass and trespasses. But you're at home. Say whatever you like. Let us pray. Giver of power and strength, you take a ragtag bunch of denying disciples and feckless followers, creating a new community of servants who seek to do your will. Keeper of all time, you are enthroned on the rubble of death's shattered power, calling us to your side and giving us a new vocation by which we serve the broken of the communities in which we live. 
constant presence of hope. You strengthen us so we never give in while confronted by evil. You continually pray for us that we never quit when faith proves to be more of a challenge than we imagined. You lift our hearts to you as we pray, as we are taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Today's scripture lesson is from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. Listen for the word of God. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him up out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. The blessing is in the hearing, the reading, the understanding, and the living of his holy word. Blessed be the name of our Lord. Amen. Do you remember the first job interview you ever had? Was it a great experience? Were you excited about it? Did you do well with it? I don't know anybody that had their first job interview and were happy with the results. I heard about uh, an interview that was done through Inc. Magazine where a young man went in to interview at a major corporation and the interview was going quite well. He was beginning to relax a little bit and to unwind, and he was getting comfortable with the interviewers. And then toward the end, one of the people on the force asked him, do you know what you're interviewing for? And it caught him so off guard that he stumbled and he stuttered and he blurted out, no. And then he tried to retract that. Needless to say, he didn't get the job. Think for a few moments about what might seem to you to be the scariest interview you will ever have. This is to be a witness for Jesus in today's world. Jesus' words that we are to be his witnesses first in Jerusalem, then in Judea, then in Samaria, and finally, to the ends of the earth, may be intimidating, to say the least. Forty days between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension to heaven, uh, you could see it as a one long job interview. He taught them about the kingdom of God. And each day, the disciples would get more and more excited about what he shared with them. Then finally, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? They thought that Jesus had been preparing them to build an earthly kingdom at that time. 
They were ready. They were willing and able, or so they thought, to assist him. And I asked the question, did they know what job they were interviewing for? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Then Jesus makes his exit, and they all join together in prayer, along with the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Okay, folks, there's a change of plans going on here. We're not going to restore Israel's kingdom now. We're going to start building the kingdom now. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit to give you the power to follow through. Jesus gives them a plan. His plan for our lives is that we will be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, before you start Googling maps to see where I'm talking about, let me bring this to you in a more convenient form. Jerusalem for us is Goshen. Judea is the larger region around us. Samaria is the place you refuse to go because it's outside your comfort zone, or the people there scare you, or you have some prejudice against those people, and you don't want to be in a confrontation. Yes, Jesus did command you to go there. No more excuses. That's what we're supposed to do. And the end of the earth, ends of the earth, it doesn't even need an explanation. We all know what that means. With the computer age upon us, we have never been better equipped for this calling. However, very few people who say they follow Jesus actually attempt to be witnesses at all. First and foremost, if we're going to be his witnesses, we need to pray. That's the first thing the disciples did. Prayer is the experience of taking on the mind, the heart, the will, and the wisdom of God. Prayer is the point where the Holy Spirit fills us with God's power and presence. God never calls us to his work unless he empowers and, equip, and equips us to do it. Like the disciples, we pray fervently for God to heal and to transform this world we live in. Second point, God says, yes, I will answer your prayers. I will transform the world through you. You are a witness, whether you know it or not. You are either a compelling witness for Jesus Christ or you're a confounding witness for Jesus Christ. If the world's going to be healed and transformed, it will happen through our witness. You are God's answer to the questions of the skeptic. The skeptic wants to know, is God real? Are the promises of God true? We should live our lives in a way that others will ask why we have great concern for justice. Why do we care so much about the down and tr downtrodden? Why do we support the local food bank? Why do we spend our time running clothing and food into the homeless in New York City? Until they ask, why are you different? Do people see and experience the character and the blessing and the message of God when they engage us? Everywhere Jesus went, he shared the message and the love of God by his works and by his actions, by the people he hung out with and those that he ate with and those he healed and those that he befriended. And that is what following Jesus will entail. 
We get to love people really well who never would step foot inside of a church. That's the whole purpose of the Holy Spirit. So the living presence of God could take up residence inside every believer. The final step is we are to be his witnesses and to trust God. You may never know how God uses your attitude, your choices, your priorities, your caring or your words to touch another life and open someone to the mind and the message of Jesus. You may never know how God will use your attitude, your choices, your priorities, your caring or your words to touch another life and open someone's mind to the presence and the message of Jesus Christ. When someone asks, why do you care? Why do you support that? Why, why, why? You answer, I have found truth and comfort in the teachings of Jesus. Don't tell them what they need. Tell them what you have found. Jesus does not need for you to be more eloquent or more charismatic or more extroverted. He needs to fill you with his Holy Spirit, the living presence and power of God, and send you out to live like he did, love like he did, and share the love of God like he did. Go, love, live. Friends, I have shared these words with you today in the name of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We are now going to celebrate the Holy Eucharist. And again, as we're separated by distance, we are going to do it with an empty hands communion. So use your mind's eye to see the loaf of bread, watch it being broken, to see the chalice, watch it being filled, then share it. I will share it with you and you share it with those around you if there's anyone near. Know this, it is a spiritual Eucharist and that's the only type of Eucharist there is. Let us pray. In fulfillment of Christ's promise, pour out your spirit on us and the gifts which grace your table. We eat the bread of life so we might be strengthened to spend ourselves so others might be made rich in your grace. We drink deeply from the cup, knowing you thirst for self-surrender so we might offer ourselves as a fountain of faith to be poured out for the world, especially the forsaken who are all around us. And at the great wedding feast of the Lamb, we will gather around your abundant table, our sisters who suffered for you on one side and our brothers who humbled themselves to lift others to their feet. We will join hands, hearts, and voices in forever singing your glad praises. Amen. On the night that our Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread from the table and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat this, remember me. At the end of the meal, he took the cup and he blessed it. He said, this will be a new covenant that will be sealed with my blood. As often as you drink of this, remember me, for I will not drink it again until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us close with prayer. We give you thanks that you have shown us the pattern of Christ to lead us through this Lenten season. 
Grant that our preparations may strengthen us in our readiness to participate in the depths of Christ's passion and to welcome Christ's resurrection. We thank you for our companions in faith through whom you have encouraged us and in whose fellowship you have bound us ever more firmly. Amen. Beloved, receive the benediction of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as they go before you, following after you, until at last you too come safely home. Amen.